live from the MGM Grand Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's The Q at Splunk.com 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Splunk. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Kelly. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in Las Vegas, Nevada here for Splunk2014.conference. Uh, the hashtag is Splunkconf, C-O-N-F. This is theCUBE, we go out to the events extracted signal from noise. Our next guest is uh, Greg Rebeck, who's the Director of Engineering at New York Air Break. Uh, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So Jeff Kelly and I have been discussing data. We love data. But it's all been about security of the keynotes. We got the DevOps angle covered. But one thing we haven't gotten to yet is the Internet of Things, right? Because, you know, data is everywhere. On the keynote, I love the line. It's on the floor, it's on the wall, it's everywhere. <laughs> you know, data is everywhere. And the theme that came out of this afternoon's interviews was analytics for everybody. So I want to get your take on um, the reality of Internet of Things. I mean, where are we? I mean, and certainly it's hyped up as, as often can see, but where's the meat on the bone for Internet of Things? So the meat on the bone is bringing all the data back to a central location and then presenting it, like, like Splunk said, analytics for everybody. So to our developers, they dig into the details, they set alerts so they can be proactive rather than reactive. And then we provide dashboards to executives, not only to our internal stakeholders, but to our external stakeholders at different levels. We provide dashboards to executives at the railroads, to their operating practices, all the way down to their mechanical departments for preventative maintenance. So these dashboards real time? Yes. Pretty much, okay, so, so talk about what before Splunk, it's kind of like BS, before Splunk and after Splunk, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah. so before Splunk, right? Um, what was the look, what, was, what did it look like? Was there like reporting? Was it old data warehousing? Did you, was there anything in place? So we lived in spreadsheet hell. So I had high value resources, you know, senior level system engineers meticulously combing through spreadsheets. Uh -huh. You know, if I wanted to report, yeah. it would take three days to get. You know, one of the things that our software does relies on is compliance. If an engineer of the locomotive is not using it, they're not going to get results. So we, in order to help the customer build a business case, we show them different levels of compliance and different return on investments. So in order to say, hey, what's the return at 65% and what's the return at 80% and building that bridge would take weeks. Now I can do it instantaneously. And what's the impact on the, on the business? So I mean, obviously, I mean, that definitely sounds like a BS environment. Um, um, pun intended on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to copyright that Splunk. You can't use that until I get some royalties. Um, so after Splunk, talk about the consequences. I mean, what was the impact? I mean, because you can start to quantify that. I'm sure you, the resources just add up their mm -hmm. value. You got any material business impact that you guys have seen? So we're not only able to build business cases for our customers very, very quickly. We went from having a nine to 12 month deployment cycle down to 90 days. Wow. Um, so like, you get kudos from management, like you get a raise, <laughs> come on, tell, what happened? No, I mean, so. Was there like people like celebrating? I mean, no, I know people. Absolutely, you know, we went from turning down business now to actually proactively going out and getting business. So you just top line, there's revenue coming it's in. It's revenue. All right, that's, that's cool. So let's take a step back. So you, 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 you manufacture, build, design, sell air brakes for, for trains, for locomotives, correct? Correct. So your customers are uh, shipping companies or? Uh, the class one railroad, so okay. Union Pacific, Norfolk Southern, mm -hmm. CSX, and then internationally we do Valet, um, over in Australia we do Rio Tinto, mm -hmm. BHP. Mm -hmm. So they're looking, so they have options where mm -hmm. they can source their air brakes from different vendors, so you're obviously, um, those, are, those are your customers. Yep. How is Splunk helping you attract and retain business? What are you able to, to provide to your customers through using tools like Splunk, using data essentially, um, to add value to your customers? So even though we have one customer, a railroad, there's really maybe five or six internal customers. Mm -hmm. You have operations, you have mechanics, you have IT, you have executive leadership. They're all siloed. And they all have their own information. We happen to be in a unique position where we interact with all of them. We need to interact with mechanical to get our product on the locomotive. We interact with IT so that we get the dispatching information to feed all the metadata to our software. So we become an aggregate across all those silos, mm -hmm. and then we can provide value back to, the, to each of those silos individually and to the railroad executive team about their operations, bringing it all together. Mm -hmm. So you can provide that, that, that's really data as a service, really, that you provide. Yes, we're the glue 
to provide uh, decision-based. So, right, well, I, I just, you know, I bring this out because I, I love the contrast. I mean, you're building a very industrial product, mm -hmm. air brakes, but at the same time, you're a very cutting edge data-led organization, essentially using data as a, as, a, as a line of business for you. Yep, in fact, one of the things that uh, one of my engineers just discovered was since we model the braking efficiency of each car in the locomotive, um, there's actually a formula that correlates to the thickness of the brake pad based on, the, on the, how much that efficiency is. So we called up our division in Kansas City that makes those brake pads, they figured out the formula, and now we can start looking at predicting um, brake pad deterioration in mm -hmm. real time. So that allows you to reach out to your customers and, and, and do proactive maintenance so that? Yeah, we can do proactive maintenance, we, we can uh, predict inventory levels mm -hmm. and pre you know, ship brake pads to the right locations mm -hmm. rather than to a central location and distribute. Mm -hmm. And that just you know, saves, I would imagine, millions of dollars when you can predict and take a proactive approach versus having a train or have to come offline because of a, a, a problem. Absolutely, the, the existing model is the trains are just scheduled every 90 days, whether it needs it or not, it comes in for an overhaul, uh -huh. and then it goes on its way. This allows that asset to stay on the railroad as long as possible, making money, and then only come in when needed. Mm -hmm. Now, talk about the efficiencies in terms of uh, just fuel efficiency. We talked a little bit beforehand. I'd love you to share that kind of anecdote. I mean, you mentioned uh, your use of uh, diesel fuel is, I think, bigger than, uh, I think you said all of the, all of the Navy. I mean, just talk yeah. about your, your use of fuel and how you can actually find efficiencies there. Yep. So what our product does is it takes in all the physics of the locomotive, mm -hmm. does some optimization, and comes up with different driving strategies. And one of those driving strategies is optimized for fuel efficiency. And that efficiency can usually ranges anywhere from five to eight percent. And a single class one railroad will use more diesel fuel in a year than the entire U.S. Navy. So even a one percent change in reduction results in tens to hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And again, you can, I'm guessing, that that is a, an area where your customers are, are looking to you to, to, to really add that value. They, you know, they, as I said, they, they look at, they probably look at the competitive bid, where are we going to source our air brakes from? If, if one vendor can say, look, we're going to help you be more efficient and save on fuel charges, yep. that is just more, easier ROI calculation for, for the, for the Absolutely. customer. Absolutely, and fuel is our number one business case that we, mm -hmm. we go with. I mean, we do other business cases where we reduce the wear and tear on the locomotives, but fuel is absolutely number one. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not sure how long you've been uh, with New York Air Brake, but can you walk us through kind of the evolution of the company in terms of getting to this more data-driven approach to serving your customers? Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure at some point it was not quite so focused on using data in this way. Right. Was it a big shift for your company, for your industry? Absolutely, the railroad is a very old industry, and, and you know, New York Air Brake itself is now celebrating its 125th year in the industry. So we tend to move a little bit slower on the technology mm -hmm. side of things than, than the rest of the world. Um, so it was around 2010 when uh, the leader products started getting traction in the industry. And we started realizing we had all this data. We know all the trains that run across the US, we know what they're carrying, how much they weigh, you know, where they're going, everything. And there was a lot of interesting things we could do with that. Mm -hmm. And so from there, we, we took that information and we're starting to build now vertical products on top of you know, our core mm -hmm. physics. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what did it look like inside the organization? Uh, it, you know, did it require you know, buy-in from the very top of the organization? What really drove that transformation? Absolutely. I, everybody kind of felt like there was something there, but they didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. So we went out and we started asking, you know, we went to our customers and said, what are your top 10 problems that you face? Then we drilled down and said, okay, how are you solving them today? What questions could you have answered that would help you get there? Mm -hmm. And how do you measure existingly with the metrics you have that these solutions that you have in place are working or not? Mm -hmm. We took that information back and then started building uh, metrics and analytics that could help answer those questions that they didn't have answers to and then help them measure to make sure that the solutions that are provided or that we do provide in the future are actually bringing in value. Mm -hmm. Um, so talk a little bit about Splunk a little more specifically. So one of the things we heard in the keynote this morning, uh, Godfrey Sullivan, the CEO of Splunk, kind of, he put up a slide where he kind of compared the old world of kind of the enterprise data warehouse and BI, which was more rigid, and you had to know the questions ahead of time, versus this new approach that Splunk and some of the other more modern tools, Hadoop and other things, enable where it's you know, unstructured data, you don't have to know the question ahead of time, schema on read, that kind of thing. Um, how, walk us through 
the reality in your organization? I'm sure. guessing you've got a, you know, you've been around for 120 plus years, so I'm sure starting 20, 30 years ago, you started working uh, on data warehousing, BI, that kind of thing. What's the environment like now between some of those older approaches that, that Godfrey kind of highlighted versus some of the new approaches and things that Splunk are enabling? So th there's very much a relationship with your data. And the old way was you had to establish that relationship, basically get engaged, get married to it, everything was well defined, and the longer you were together, the harder it was to divorce, the more ugly it got, <laughs> right? Now it's kind of like speed dating. Mm -hmm. I can try something, I can bring new data in, I can you know, basically try different things out without a commitment. And that has definitely you know, accelerated our, our pace and then the ability to service our customers. You know, before it was do all this research, get a commitment, build you know, long, big business cases up to executive leadership, get approval, and by that time, you may, not, may or may not have been the market leader. Very slow, very multi-year cycles. Now we, we're, we're looking at quarterly cycles. We want to test something, we can just bring in the data, test something out, put, put a proof of concept together, serve it to our customer, and then get feedback and see so what you guys get. Work. So basically, it's like going into the tunnel to use the locomotive example. Mm -hmm. You don't really know. You can do all that investment, all that energy, mm -hmm. time. I mean, it's muscle work too. You're, it's a heavy lift, right? Yep. And you don't even know what the hell's going to come out of it, right? So you got all that prep work. So what you're saying is you're now in the mode of you can do some heavy lifting, like a light workout, if you will. Yep. Get some real taste of what where it's going, and then iterate quickly. Absolutely. And that's like a night and day situation. Absolutely. I mean, that, that must boost the morale up a little bit. Absolutely, All the engineers are very excited. Uh, they're, they're not afraid to uh, ask questions and then dig in, where before they were like, oh, do I really want to invest all my time and effort into it because it became you know, very uh, overhead intensive. Now it's, yeah. you know, let's be creative. So, so Jeff's doing a, a bunch of research right now around the role of developers in big data. So I want to get your take on this because you just hits the point that we've been talking about, which we love is, when you get developers exposed to the data and they can taste it, a little heroin action going on, mm -hmm. a little bit of addiction, the creativity comes out, which is kind of cool, because they're yep. close to the front lines now, they're certainly close to the front lines, but what does that do for the organization, and, and does that work? And, and are developers now thinking like data is part of the development process, meaning, What's it like now in this environment for you guys as, as a great case study? Because are the developers like, give me the data? Are they like data, uh, data hordes? Are they hungry for the data? I mean, <laughs> what's going on with the role of the developer particularly? So it brings a new energy to the organization. So development has always been part science and then part art. And we've always kind of shoved the art part back in the corner and just said, hey, here's your tickets, go crank these out and stay yeah. back there in the closet. Yeah. Now they get to express that creativeness and they interact with each other much more, and that boosts morale, boosts productivity. You know, it's seven o'clock and people are still hanging around the office rather than you know, 4.30 and staring at their watch. So would you consider data to be a key part of that? I mean, the data pipeline? I, absolutely. It's an enabler to give the developers that uh, creativity, because it gives them the facts to come back to the leadership team and say, hey look, look what I discovered. Right. This is what I can do and this is the value it brings. So before I hand it back to Jeff, Jeff wants to jump in. We fight for the microphone when we get, <laughs> we get, we get some good topics going here. So I got to ask you, I'll get to Jeff, what's the coolest thing that you've done with the data? In the, in the after Splunk scenario, right? So mm -hmm. before Splunk, you had the manual spreadsheet hell, now you're in an awesome environment, liberation, happy, everyone's having, you know, drinking beer, partying. <laughs> um, what's the coolest thing you guys have done? I think the coolest thing is correlating the information coming from the train from our models and then correlating to real physical assets like those brake pads. You know, being able to look at and say exactly, you know, this brake pad's going to be three quarters of an inch thick because it, it experienced this much braking effort. I mean, that's, that's really cool to correlate something that you modeled to seeing the physical result and being very accurate. And, that, you, and then you guys should put resources behind that big time. Yep, and we can look at, there's other problems in the railroads. One of the problems is hot bearing detection. Yeah. And there's, that's been a problem for 20 plus years that's nobody been able to solve because they've all been looking at those bearings. We can now take a step back, look at other things that maybe influence those bearings, build a correlation, 
and then solve that problem. I can see the headline now, big data stops the runaway train. <laughs> Literally with the brakes. <laughs> so, Absolutely. That's awesome, well you guys are awesome. Jeff, go ahead. So, that, that's, that's why you're the uh, founding and editor of SiliconANGLE and a great media. You, the, you can come up with headlines like that uh, on the fly. It's New York Post-like. Yeah. It's basically, it's, good it's very good. can't go wrong, best headlines in the business. Uh, Daily news that's the true, that's true. Most entertaining for sure. Uh, just want to take a step back. John mm -hmm. mentioned the data pipeline and it just kind of jogged something in my memory from the keynotes this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, a gentleman from Coca-Cola was up there talking about, in his case, using the cloud, but essentially automating a data pipeline. So that data right. is being fed into, in his case, what he called it, a data lake. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever you want to call it, how do you go about making sure that all the data sources you need are brought together in a place where you can access them and do the kind of analytics that you've been talking about? And how do you make that, do you automate that process? How do you go about doing that? So we do automate that process. So all the locomotives have a wireless connection to a back office, so a communication server. And we need that not only to get the event logs, but also to send you know, things like speed restrictions down to locomotives, so if there's track work going on, or what the train's makeup is, et cetera. But those logs get offboard to the communication server, and then they get sent back to our office, mm -hmm. and then they get processed. So one of the things that you know, Splunk is helping us do now is before that analysis used to take two to three days, because they would have to basically redo the entire run, and that was called playback. It would create a DVR style, you know, what the engineer saw on his screen, what all the forces were, what, what was all the characteristics. Now, with Splunk, we can kind of do that in real time, near real time, and we don't have to wait days, we wait hours. Mm -hmm. so, and it, so I was going to say, so what, what is the value of that? And that, you just explained it. It's the, yeah. it's the, the time, to, time to insight, really. Yep, and, it, and it's very important whenever there's a, an incident on the railroad such a break into, um, that, that is very important to the railroad that they get that information back of what happened, what occurred, was it the, the driver's fault, what, did they have a faulty coupler or knuckle, mm -hmm. it was an equipment failure. They need that analysis right away so that they can address the situation. Mm -hmm. um, so last question for me, so you know, at Wikibon, as John mentioned, we're doing a lot of research around talking to big data practitioners and trying to identify what are the key characteristics of successful big data pra uh, practitioners. From your opinion, from, from your perspective, what are some of those key characteristics at your company that has enabled you to really leverage data? Um, and that could be technology, it could be culture, it could be leadership. What are some of those key characteristics at your company? I think the key characteristic is not going in saying, hey, we have big data, let's go tell us what the data can, can find for us and building false correlations. Um, if you remember back in the 90s, you had the magic eyes. You had to stare at the newspaper and move it out cross-eyed. You know, that your data kind of looks like that. You know, all jumbled together and you're trying to make a picture out of it. With Splunk, you put on glasses and you see the picture. By bringing all that together and building relationships between the data and what your business needs and, and, and using a question-based, problem-based approach to the data, mm -hmm. then uh, you'll find success. And that, that has been very successful for us in understanding what our customers need, mm -hmm. because they have all the data today. We're not, we're not getting any more information that they don't already have, but we're, we're providing a tremendous amount of value that they don't have. So have you guys quantified any of the savings, like a 1% savings? We, and I interviewed the C, with the CEO of G, we interviewed all their top customers, the chairman mm -hmm. of United Airlines. I mean, a 1% savings to United Airlines because the data that they've got is over a billion dollars. Right. And that's United Airlines, but you guys aren't, aren't United Airlines, but you have significant impact. Yep. Any quantification? So on average, we save our customers about a billion dollars a year between fuel, uh, reduction. How much? A billion dollars. One billion. One billion oh, so dollars. so you're in the B. We're in the big B. All right, awesome. And how much data do you guys have coming through there? It's not uh, massive data. No, so we, we, we only have a 10 gig license. So no matter what she tells you, it doesn't matter how big your data is, it's how you use it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't come knocking if the yep. locomotive's rocking. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, we hit the big B, uh, and that's fuel savings is a big chunk of that, and uh, in-train force management, which is basically preventing those breaking twos. So, I got to ask you, are you a Yankees fan? No, I grew no. up in Cleveland, Ohio, so I'm a big Indians, Cleveland okay. Browns fan. Just want to make sure, because we're Red Sox fans in Massachusetts, <laughs> so, you know, we're going to talk about it, because if Dave Vellante was here, we'd be talking about the Yankees, because the G year thing, but, uh, mm -hmm. Well, that's great. I mean, you guys saving a lot of money for your customers, yeah. and obviously safety is a huge issue. Absolutely. Uh, any reports there? So, the positive train control, which is basically a act by Congress that said, "Hey, the technology exists. If a guy's busy texting and a locomotive blows a red light, the technology exists to stop the locomotive." 
that's going to roll out next year, and that's going to bring a whole new data stream into the organization. We'll know signal states, we'll know, just can't even imagine yet what we'll know, and that's going to help us build some, some tougher safety products. Greg, great stuff, creativity. I mean, I love the developer success, love the customer value proposition. I mean, it's really a great case study. Again, this is, we're not making this stuff up, this is real. Big data kind of gets some real tangible numbers, that's to me, Jeff, what we talk about GE and other companies doing the Internet of Things, it's fantastic. This Internet of Things is real and it's billions of dollars of value, quantified, not like pie in the sky. Greg, thanks so much. All right, this is theCUBE live in Las Vegas. We'll be right back. I'm John Furrier here with Jeff Kelly with Wikibon, live in Las Vegas. We'll be right back after this short break.